Conversations with Great Minds. You are probably familiar with Congressman Ro Khanna as the guy who comes on this program every couple of weeks and answers your questions for an hour, the vice chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, really smart guy and a great congressman from uh, the Silicon Valley area. But you probably don't realize that he is by and large, or by, probably by far, the most tech savvy guy in the U.S. House of Representatives, maybe in all, probably in all of Congress. Uh, he represents Silicon Valley, as I mentioned. Uh, he is a uh, Yale Law School graduate. Uh, I mean, just uh, a, a serious intellectual as well as a brilliant progressive. And he's got a new book out, and it's titled Dignity in a Digital Age. And it's just brilliant. Uh, on the line with us is Congressman Khanna. Uh, Congress, as our great mind for, for this half hour. Congressman, welcome back to the program. Tom, I'm, I'm honored by all that. I didn't know you had a great mind series. It's a, a little bit humbling to be on, uh, on this uh, program as opposed to the weekly uh, question and answer. We actually do. There's a, in fact, there's a website, Conversations of Great Minds. It goes back like a decade. I mean, you know, we've had all kinds of incredible people on. So, uh, so glad to have you, Congressman. So you live in a district that represents, uh, first of all, if I just uh, a little bit of conversation about politics, then I want to get into tech stuff. You live in a district, or you represent a district, that includes the headquarters of Apple, Google, Intel, and Yahoo. I mean, it doesn't get more techy than that. And yet, as a member of Congress, and as a candidate, as a political candidate, because in the House you run every two years, you refuse to take money from corporate PACs, from political action committees. Um, that's pretty damn impressive. How, how did you pull that off? Well, I was fortunate to have a lot of grassroots support, a lot of individual support. But the reason I didn't want to take the PAC money is then it obligates you to support a lot of the company's official positions. And I have taken positions on antitrust uh, that the companies disagree with. I've taken uh, positions on an Internet Bill of Rights and data privacy that the companies uh, disagree with. There are things that the companies do well that I champion, but there are things that they're doing right now uh, that are not correct, and it ge just gives me uh, much more freedom to, to speak out um, and be independent. That's that's a great take. That this is this is all about independence. Um, Ninety percent of the you you note in your book, and and we're talking with Congressman Ro Khanna. He's uh, the author of two books actually, um, but his latest is Dignity in a Digital Age: Making Tech Work for All of Us. You write that uh, ninety percent of innovation job growth in the last couple of decades has come out of five cities and that about half of all the digital service jobs are just in 10 major uh, major metro centers you write uh, americans are quote disconnected from the wealth generation of the digital economy uh, can you speak to that and what your solutions are for that Sure. I mean, look, there's $11 trillion of market cap, Tom, in my district. $11 trillion. Apple has gone in the last two years from $1 trillion to $3 trillion. It's probably the most wealth generated in any one region uh, in human history. And this region has grown 40%, while a lot of the rest of the America is, is struggling. And uh, you're going to have 25 million, quote-unquote, digital jobs by 2025. By the way, a lot of these are in manufacturing a lot of them are in construction. Just because something has a tech component uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't intersect with other industries. And many of them are concentrated. So GM, instead of hiring tech folks to build their new cars uh, in Michigan, uh, has put it, them in Silicon Valley. And you have these areas that have become the wealth centers. Uh, where people, by the way, if you poll my district, very optimistic about America and what's happened in the rest of the country. Uh, they've, in many parts, been sold false promises that somehow globalization or the new economy was going to work for them, uh, that uh, they should just move, that they should just get trained, and that everything would be fine. Well, they've experienced job loss. They've experienced deindustrialization. They've experienced a brain drain with kids having to leave their hometowns. And so the heart of the book is arguing uh, for policies that will decentralize tech innovation to mid-sized cities to rural America to black and brown communities and have a real place-based focus uh, in industrial policy really in, in, in our country. And you look at sort of Intel going to New Albany, Ohio and saying we're going to create uh, 7,000 construction jobs, 3,000 manufacturing jobs. Those are the types of revitalization projects that uh, can take place if we actually had place-based policy. 
Correct me if I'm misremembering my history, but it, my recollection is that in the 90s, um, part of Bill Clinton's sales pitch for NAFTA and, and for ultimately um, uh, you know, normalizing relations with China and, and, and uh, exercising the, the general agreement on tariffs and trades to create the World Trade Organization was that we don't need all these dirty manufacturing jobs where people like lose fingers when they go to work. Um, because we've got this extraordinary explosion of tech jobs coming. We're going to move from blue collar to white collar, and it's going to be a good thing for America. Uh, you know, I, I remember all that rhetoric quite well, and, and, and people like Thomas Friedman, you know, championing it. But I don't remember any policies other than so-called free trade, let's just send all our jobs to China. I mean, we lost 60,000 factories as a consequence of that. I don't recall anything that actually was... Specifically, I, I, I suppose you could say the Telecommunications Act, but it's just pieces of that, and, and it did some real damage, by the way, to the, to the, the radio and newspaper and television industries, um, that, that actually was expanding tech in the United States beyond places like Silicon Valley, like the place that you represent. Am I, am I misremembering? I mean, are you trying to like fix up a, a, a previous mistake here by a, by a previous Democratic administration? And not just Democratic. I mean, you know, the Republicans were all in on this free trade stuff, too. Well, it's been 40 years of uh, neglect, and uh, I didn't support, obviously, NAFTA and uh, some of the trade deals, and we do need a manufacturing base uh, in this country. But putting that aside, the the idea that uh, people could just gravitate to these jobs and that you, we would just have folks be trained for uh, these new tech jobs and move at a time where it's expensive to move, uh, where people want to live with communities, uh, in the communities they grew up, I was naive. And there was no sense of, well, how do we get the new manufacturing of the new economy uh, in these places? Okay, if we're not going to have the traditional uh, manufacturing in some places, well, what about the semiconductor manufacturing? What about manufacturing on electric vehicles? What about uh, all of the new types of uh, uh, innovation jobs that require uh, construction and technology infrastructure as well? How are we getting that in places that have seen other uh, jobs go offshore. And then what are we doing to create uh, some of the modern wealth generation and these digital jobs, which are not just go become a coder at Google, which are uh, you know, digital jobs in retail, digital jobs in agriculture. What are we doing to actually create those jobs uh, in the middle class jobs in these communities? And I believe there was not nearly enough thought uh, put into it. It was all about, well, uh, innovation is taking place, wealth is being generated, the markets are doing well, consumers are doing well. Uh, but as we uh, did that, uh, you basically had the desolation of a lot of towns uh, across the country, cities across the country. Yes, tax the billionaires in my district, absolutely higher taxes, uh, invest it, but we need to do something more fundamental, and that is actually provide people with economic pride and opportunity in a 21st century economy where they live. And I don't think enough thought has gone into that over the last 40 years. We're talking with Congressman Ro Khanna uh, about his new book, uh, Digi Dignity in a Digital Age, Making Tech Work for All of Us. Um, in, your, in your book, Con Congressman, you talk about how uh, the pandemic actually kind of shattered the conventional wisdom about tech concentration. And, and you say the promise is of new jobs without sudden cultural displacement. And in fact, you're calling for federal contractors to have at least 10% of their workforces in rural communities. Am I, do I have that right? R rural communities and black and, and, and the Latino communities, yes. So how, how, how does that work? I mean, do, is this the sort of thing that's done by legislation? Done by legislation, or it could be done by uh, agencies in, in, uh, as they uh, in, in, in dole out these contracts. I mean, these companies get huge, huge contracts to do uh, federal technology work. It's almost 80 billion or 100 billion that the federal government contracts out out for these projects. And here's one of the myths, unfortunate myths, has become that these digital jobs, 25 million, require some advanced coding uh, skills or, uh, or or all these computer science skills. They don't. A lot of them are actually blue collar jobs. Most of them, you don't need a four year degree. You need eight months, ten months credentialing. Uh, but you do need uh, to have a certain type of uh, uh, a course in credentialing, and that is if the federal government were to say, look, 10% of your 
workforce has to be in a rural community or 10 percent has to be african-american uh and or uh, or latino you would immediately incentivize these companies uh to partner with land-grant universities partner with hbcus have people on those projects that that can uh, uh can do this work and and by the way then you would also incentivize them to create jobs uh, for fortune 500 companies that that need a lot of different types of skills uh, and, and basically creating the new middle class in some of these jobs uh, that currently are concentrated on, on in a few coastal cities. Congressman, uh, it's, it's been a few months since I read your book, and, and uh, so forgive me if I'm misremembering, but my recollection is that a lot of the, uh, in particular the, the opening parts of the book, were about your and other people's experience uh, of growing up in America as the children of immigrants, growing up in America as, as a person of color. Um, how has that informed your understanding and perspective with regard to tech and, and you know, the, the solutions and suggestions you're putting forward in your new book? That's a very thoughtful question, Tom. I would say in two ways. On, on, on one hand, I'm so uh, aware of the debt uh, that uh, I owe to the civil rights movement. So when my parents immigrated from India uh, post-1965, the Immigration Reform Act, that was only possible because of the civil rights movement. Before then, 90-some uh, percent of immigration to this country was European. There were very strict quotas and basically very hard to immigrate uh, to the United States if you were uh, Indian or, or Chinese. And it was the civil rights movement that opened uh, those doors. Uh, and the civil rights movement, of course, uh, influenced in part by Gandhi and the Indian independence movement. And my grandfather, as, as you may remember, was in jail four years during Gandhi's independence movement. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's this uh, continuous sense. In fact, you know, one of the great honors I had is talking about Reverend uh, Lawson and his time in India with John Lewis. And he talked about how he t brought some of Gandhi's teachings to uh, to Tennessee and taught him about, uh, about civil rights. But because of that, uh, interconnection, I uh, think now that you have all these Indian Americans who have in brilliant ways ascended uh, to the top of the tech uh, leadership, Sundar Pichai at Google, Satya Nadella at Microsoft, uh, I think there's a particular responsibility uh, and obligation to expand that uh, to communities that have been totally left out, like the African American uh, community uh, and the Latino community. A lot of Indians, when they came to this country, couldn't get jobs at a Harvard or a Stanford. They were hired at the HBCUs uh, because that's the only place where they would employ them. So uh, part of my perspective and an immigrant story is, well, what is our debt obligation uh, to communities uh, now left out and that, uh, that centered in part on the African-American community? The second part of my story is probably a more hopeful story, and that is growing up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, uh, having a lot of people encourage me, believe in me, having the Bucks County Courier Time publish my letters to the editor uh, and growing up with a sense of still hope and uh, uh, optimism about America. And I think that still comes through in the book. Some people may say naively and others may say, no, there's still some goodness and decency and prospect of us becoming a multiracial, multiethnic democracy. I, I think there is. <laughs> I, I think without that, we're really screwed, don't you? I mean, isn't this really a, 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 a pivotal, pivotal question for our future? Well, my favorite chapter, actually, of the book is the last chapter, and it has uh, it, it, not, not, nothing to do directly with tech. It, tech is sort of a lens to achieving this vision. And I think one of the great underappreciated speeches in American history is Frederick Douglass's Composite Nation. If people, whether you read my book or not, please read that speech. And Douglass, here's Douglass, who has been a slave for 20 years. Uh, standing up for Chinese integration and being hopeful about America's prospect of becoming a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy. And it's so uplifting. Uh, Congressman, we were just uh, just a moment ago talking about the immigrant experience and, and the, the racial dimensions, as it were, of, uh, well, of America. <laughs> Frankly, you were, you were talking about Frederick Dick <laughs> Douglass. And, um, but you, you point out in your book that uh, about 20% of computer science graduates are either black or Latino. But only about 10 percent of the comp of the employees of the big tech companies are black or Latino, and fewer than three percent of venture capital, or less than three percent of venture capital, ends up in the hands of black and Latino entrepreneurs. 
Um, you're suggesting solutions for this. Yes. Uh, here's why it matters. You can't overcome the racial wealth gap unless you overcome the racial wealth generation gap. And right now you have uh, app applications like Clubhouse that are popularized by uh, black uh, artists and, and black musicians, uh, but there are no African-Americans uh, actually in the in the board uh, seats. They're not benefiting from the venture capital. They're not uh, the founders. Uh, and so you have all these IPOs and wealth generation basically aggravating uh, the racial wealth gap, which is 10 to 1. Uh, and I say, look, in addition to uh, incentivizing the hiring of, uh, uh, of African-American graduates, uh, we ought to be uh, incentivizing or requiring diversity on the boards because that's going to change the culture, uh, actually focus on retaining people, which is one of the big challenges. It's not just uh, recruiting them. Uh, we ought to focus on incentivizing venture capital to go uh, to uh, women and African-American partners who would take much more risk in investing in uh, new entrepreneurs who have as much talent and dreams but don't have the same networks. And, you know, the end to tie it back quickly to the end chapter, the point is it's not just about the racial wealth gap, but as you know, W.E.B. Du Bois has this beautiful line of us being co-workers in the kingdom of culture. And part of the problem is that the, those creating the modern digital culture and, and architecture and uh, are, are very exclusive and it is not inclusive and you can't have a democracy or co-workers of equals in creating culture if people are excluded from a huge part of uh, the digital life and digital wealth generation. Yeah, I, I totally get it. You also take on a, a couple of really big issues in your book and, and we got about a minute and a half here. Algorithmic amplification, you talk about how Facebook, uh, you know, 64% of extremist groups joins are due to their recommendations. Uh, you talked about, you know, the, 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 the slaughter of Rohingya Muslims in, in uh, Myanmar coming out of, out of uh, Facebook. Um, what do we do about this? And data mining as Uncon well. It's unconscionable. First of all, we ought to have legal liability where people can sue in the United States court under the Alien Torts Act. I mean, the, what Facebook did was target people who are most vulnerable with uh, information saying, go join QAnon. That's how it grew. Uh, and in Myanmar, basically, they allowed their platforms to be used to, to, to in, incite uh, human rights violations. I mean, in the incitement of violence. So there ought to be legal consequences. And here, I mean, uh, with Instagram, they're basically selling a product they know is causing depression with uh, teenagers. And I don't understand why the same rules of consumer protection don't apply to Facebook. I mean, how can you sell a product that is causing depression with teenagers uh, and uh, not be have a consequence? In part, I think the intimidation of lawmakers about technology gives license uh, to these tech CEOs to, to, to not have accountability. And what they fear is folks who just may understand this enough to say, no, we need accountability. Yeah. Amen. Congressman Ro Khanna, his new book is Dignity in a Digital Age. You can find it wherever great books are available. Congressman, thanks so much for dropping by. It's always great talking thanks. with you. This, thanks. This you really good. appreciate it. It's an honor to be on. My pleasure. Uh, and, and, and back at you. Thank you. And, and a brilliant Thank book. You. I encourage everybody to get a copy.